Do you know what time it is? It is time once again to shield the work that Lena and others are doing on supporting Linux on the Apple M1 and M2 systems. Now, if you're somehow completely out of the loop and had no idea this was going on, there is a project called Asahi Linux. Basically, this is a collection of projects to support Linux on this hardware, not just on the laptops, on the desktop systems and things coming out in the future as well. And the goal isn't to be a Linux distro, this is just a convenient way to ship everything out. The ultimate goal is to get everything upstream to the kernel and shipped out to distros, so basically anything out there can go and use it. And early on, a lot of people said this project was a waste of time and was never going to go anywhere. And now, this is where we are. Well, not now. This is from the start of the month. A lot more progress has been made from here. KDE runs on the M1 Ultra, fully composited and accelerated Plasma desktop on the M1 Ultra. My kernel driver now supports the entire M1 family and Alyssa also fixed the wobbly Windows glitch in Mesa. Oh, and Supertux Cart also works properly now as well. And if this was the end of the project and nothing else improved from here, this would already be incredibly impressive. This is usable, albeit not as fast as you would actually like it to be. You can probably notice that some of the uh, animations going into the background here aren't running at a full frame rate, especially this here. The wobbly windows are a little bit laggy, but it's functional. So the next step from here seems pretty obvious. Let's deal with that problem. Now, going through this GPU driver development process, the drivers that Lena is making haven't supported the absolute latest version of OpenGL. There's no point doing that if your drivers aren't stable. It's just going to make things far more complex. So as she's been getting things stable and getting things actually working, it's been going up and up through the versions. I believe this test right here is done with OpenGL 2.1. So the next step then is to move up to OpenGL 3.0, basically bring the GPU support somewhere in the range of 2006 or so. And by doing that, things got a little bit better. How about Xenotic on the Apple M1, running natively on Linux with Alyssa's latest Mesa branch and my Rust kernel driver? Oh yeah, and OBS also works. GLES2, which is OpenGL ES2, DEQP test passing at 99.89%, and for GELS3 at 90.75%, four XMSAA support as well, which I think is kinda crazy. Now do keep in mind that Lena isn't the only person working on this project. As crazy as that would be, this was like a one person effort, there are other people involved. For example, you've seen that a lot of the work that Lena is doing is supported by the work that Alyssa is doing over on Mesa. And there's a bunch of other people that don't have as much of a public persona that are working on this as well. Lena just gets a lot of attention because she does like 10, 12 hour streams working on and testing this code. Now, if you've been paying attention to the footage in the background, you can probably tell it's not as smooth as you'd normally expect Xenotic to be. There's very clearly a bit of choppiness here and there, especially when, you know, more player models appear on the screen and effects are appearing on the screen. So it's not running at a solid 60 FPS, but the fact that it's running is crazy in and of itself. And the fact that it's running means that things can be improved. And, you know, judging by the fact that almost 10% of the tests are failing, you wouldn't expect it to be in an absolute perfect state. So with just a little bit more tweaking, Ultra Xenotic now is working. It turns out the reason it was running out of RAM was just texture compression. Just enable BCN slash DXTN texture compression, which are like texture compression algorithms, and now it doesn't even use 4 gigabytes of RAM with the highest texture quality, which it shouldn't be using that much RAM, it's just Xenotic. Like, it does look pretty good for an open source game, but it's still just Xenotic. Now, everything you've seen so far has just been on the Apple M1 systems, but the Apple M2 systems have been out for quite a while as well, and it's not like those being neglected either. So the next step is do the exact same thing 
over on Apple M2. KDE runs on the Apple M2 with full GPU acceleration running Xenotic, GL Mark II, and EGL gears at the same time. My Rust Linux kernel driver now supports the M2 and it works out of the box with a Lissa's Mesa driver. No use space changes needed. And as you can see here, it's just a screenshot in this case, but everything is running. And I know someone is gonna say, but what about GNOME? So if you paid any attention to this project, one thing you would know is GNOME's actually been less of a challenge to get working. KDE initially did kind of work, but it was a black screen with a logo, whereas at that time GNOME would actually load. I'm not sure what the deal was there, I'm sure there's some real technical explanation, but yes, GNOME also works just fine as well. But where it gets even more ridiculous is the battery life. Not only can you play Xenotic on Ultra at 60 FPS, you can do it 8 hours on battery. So I unplugged the M2 MacBook Air while running Xenotic windowed at 1920 or 1080 in a GNOME desktop at 60 FPS. The estimated battery runtime is almost 8 hours. Hours. Now you might be saying, oh, but maybe this is some like weird calculation issue from the drivers they made to calculate it on Linux. No, no it's not. Because the way the battery is calculated is done in hardware and is the exact same way it is done on macOS. All they are doing is querying that data. As Lena confirms in this tweet, yes, the number is accurate. It's from the battery controller, the same data that macOS uses. Now, I don't believe she's actually done a full eight hour test to see if it actually does last that long. Because, you know, when you have an estimated battery life, things might not actually go the way the estimation is saying it's going to go. I'd imagine it's still a quite a long time, but whether it's actually 8 hours is still up for debate. Now while KDE and GNOME are here, you may be wondering about other desktops like XSCE, and you may be wondering whether KDE and GNOME are running on Xorg or over on Wayland. And right now, they are running on Wayland. Someone asked, does X11 work as well? X11 does work, but not very well, because its display output model is obsolete and not a good match for the display output hardware. And I heard XSC's compositor specifically doesn't work due to missing VBlank IRQ support. This doesn't have anything to do with the GPU though. So theoretically, yes, it can work, and other desktops that run only on X11 can work as well, but Wayland is just a much better experience and seems to be where a lot of the focus is being spent. There's no point wasting your time getting X11 working when you could spend all of that time just improving the desktop experience full stop and deal with Wayland. Now, I know all of this stuff may look super exciting, and if you already have an Apple Silicon system, it may look like it's ready to just go and daily drive. And yeah, I'm sure you could probably go and use this. But do keep in mind, this is still very much alpha software, not just with the GPU drivers, but with other things running on the system as well. There's plenty of bugs still available, let alone just the bugs in the GPU driver. And then there's still things like getting everything upstreamed. There are certain things that have been upstreamed into the kernel. There are certain packages available in certain distros like the M1 N1 bootloader over on Manjaro. A lot of the stuff available for us here Linux is also available in the AUR. So you can go and install a lot of that stuff relatively easily. But functionality is also missing missing in a lot of places as well. Like say you want OpenCL support for doing anything related to compute, which isn't actually that far away, but is still something that needs to be worked on. Lena is clearly interested in OpenCL, but OpenGL is a much more important focus because this is used on the general Linux desktop. And then there's things like Vulkan, for example. A Vulkan driver, from my understanding, isn't even remotely in the works and is a long way away still. But let's imagine for a second we actually did have this Vulkan driver. You may think then, because Linux is also running on this system, you could then go and do games on Steam, for example, running them through Proton, just running your regular Windows games. This is a little bit harder than you might think, because running a Windows game on Linux is difficult, but you're only converting the Windows by 
but you're only converting the Windows calls into Linux calls. If you want to do the same thing over on the M1 Mac running Linux, not only are you converting the Windows calls into Linux calls, you're also converting the x86 calls into ARM calls. And this is a very expensive process to do both these things at the same time. There are tools to go and do one or the other. For example, you have Wine to do the Windows to Linux, and then there's tools like FEX for converting the x86 and the ARM. But there's nothing that I know of that does both of these at the exact same time in a way that is performant enough to actually play a game. At least that's open source and not a virtual machine. Obviously, virtual machines will go and do so, but then you have the overhead of a virtual machine. Now, there was a project called Hangover that did aim to go and do this, doing both of these conversion steps. But not much work is being done on it. The last commit was a year ago, and a lot of other things haven't been touched in two years, four years. This project is basically dead. So long into the future, while all that stuff would be super cool, let's keep things for now a little bit more grounded on things that can be actually improved. Right now, the system is scoring a GL Mark II score of 3568, putting it somewhere in line of the RX 550 and the RX 470, which is by no means bad, but is considerably slower than where the system actually should be. So I hope in a couple of years when the M1 support is basically complete, us here Linux is then dealing with like the M5, the M6 systems, that Linux can be installed on these original Apple Silicon systems, and even though it's not going to be that repairable, even though there's going to be faster systems available, installing Linux on it is going to keep some of these machines out of e-waste. So as always, Go check out the work that Lena and everybody else involved in the Us Here Linux project is doing. And in a couple of months, I'll probably do another update video on this just to give a indication of where the project is currently at. There are still some people out there who have no idea this project exists and no idea that Linux actually works on these M1 systems, albeit not perfectly, but works. And that is really cool. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Do you have an Apple Silicon system? Do you care at all about this project? Or do you just think it's kind of cool? I would love to know. So if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe, and the pay link in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robson Plays. That's going to be it for me. And... I'm out.